Diane, do you want to read the agenda while the yeah. audio? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight's meeting is being held uh, virtually, and um, it starts at 7 o'clock where we have a reading of the agenda, and then we can amend or approve the agenda and any public comment. Uh, item number one is our consent agenda, which is the payroll warrant and discussion on our next meeting date. Uh, item number two is consideration of a revenue tax anticipation note. It's a borrowing authorization with Heidi Doyle, our town treasurer. Item number three is consideration of road improvement plan, chapter 90 projects with Sean Clean, our DPW director. Item number four is our COVID-19 team update with Zach Ward, our fire chief and emergency management director. Number five is consideration of various action items due to the COVID-19 disruption, such as the declaration of a local emergency, confirmation of the May 1st, 2020 property tax due date, a new date for annual town meeting, and the dates are reserved. They are June 16th, June 23rd, and also June 18th and June 25th. We're gonna finalize the Prop 2 and a half ballot questions that are due to the town clerk's office a discussion about town election postponement under Chapter 45 of the Acts of 2020. Then we'll have consideration of administrative items and routine business, the finance director, budget development update, town administrator, personnel update, select board member report update, and then the board will go into executive session under the following exemptions. will not return to public session. Item number one, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to the threatened potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the town and the chair so declares the library. Item number two, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town and the chair so declares police officers union. Item number three, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 21A, Subsection 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, the town administrator. Thank you, Diane. Um, have do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. You have <laughs> to do you. roll call votes, George. Oh, we got to do roll call votes? Every vote, the roll call vote. Okay. Mr. Waldron? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Jan? Aye. Mr. Dorensis? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Okay. Um, I have a point next, for next, we have public comment. I know David Linsky was kind enough to join us tonight. So, David, if you'd Eric like to. Eric is raising um, his hand. Eric's got a question, I think. Well, whoever's hosting the meeting, is there a way to, um, I know there is a way, if you can figure out, to mute all others except for maybe the select board and whoever's speaking, because we are getting background noise because there's so many people on and people are selectively muting right now. I've been on meetings okay. like this, with a public meeting, and there's ways to control that mute. And I don't know if anyone else is getting, if I'm getting a lot of background noise. But I'm muted. There we go. Can Dave, whoever just, okay, I'm unmuted. Let's let David Linsky make a uh, talk now if we can. Somebody who's unmuting. Sorry. There we go. All right. Now we're all unmuted, but. All right. Can you uh, can, can you guys hear me at this point? Yes. 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 All right. Good. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, George, and thank you, other members, for giving me a few minutes to, to speak tonight. Um, obviously, we are faced with an unprecedented situation, 
And this is a time when I think all of us need to appreciate what local government does, because no matter what is happening at the state level, what is happening at the federal level, what the people in Sherburne need to feel most comfortable and most confident in is what is happening at the Sherburne level. And so I initially, I just want to say thank you for the volunteer work that you're doing and thank you to the town employees with particular thanks to the Board of Public Health, the public safety officials, and everybody else who's trying to do the best that they possibly can for the people of Sherburne. The first message that I want to give you tonight is that my office is open and available to serve the people of Sherburne um, in any way that we possibly can. Uh, all of us who hold public office would not have run if we did not want to help people. And that is exactly what we're doing right now. So my office on a daily basis right now is handling an enormous crush, quite frankly, of unemployment claims and health insurance related claims, as well as trying to help people on a one person or one family at a time basis to make sure that no one, no family is left behind and that we are able to, to help as many people as possible. So I want to encourage everyone in Sherburne who has a need or a question, no matter how big or how small, to contact me either via email or at the State House by telephone, or I'm going to give out my cell phone right now. So email is David dot linsky at mahouse.gov david dot linsky at mahouse.gov the state house phone number and we have calls forwarded so that my staff can answer is 617-722-2575 617-722-2575 my personal cell phone number and I encourage people to call me, is area code 508-395-8097. 508-395-8097. Um, we're putting aside legislative business unless that business is directly related to helping people as a result of this horrible, horrible situation that we're all in. And we're prioritizing that and we're prioritizing um, constituent service. You've heard me often talk about the three different jobs of being a state legislator. The first is the legislative business. The second is being an advocate for the, for the cities and towns that are in our district. In my case, Natick, Sherburn, and Millis. And the third and most important part, and this is what we're prioritizing right now, is helping individual people and individual families when they have issues where government at any level, at any level, um, uh, it can be helpful. And so that's what we're doing. I want people to know that we are there to help and that we are open for business. We've already taken some legislative action related to this. Just before this hit, the state legislature appropriated an extra $15 million to the State Department of Public Health in anticipation of this crisis. In addition to that, we've now taken several steps related to municipal government, some of which I expect that you'll act on tonight in relation to setting dates for uh, the town election or for town meeting or on tax bills. And we continue to look for ways uh, that are necessary to uh, help town government. Uh, the House today passed a bill related to changing some permitting, some automatic issuance of permits. Um, and I expect that will land on the governor's desk very shortly. We recognize the problems the towns are having in this situation, and we are here to help. So I encourage each of you to contact me if there's anything very specific to Sherburn uh, that uh, may have been missed in this and I'll get it put on the agenda. Um, in addition to that, I am in, a, in daily contact 
so that you know, with the uh, Chiefs and Metro West Medical Center. Uh, both the Lennon Morse campus and the Framingham Union campus. And we are working with them to make sure that they're ready for what we all hope doesn't happen, but we all fear is gonna be happening in a couple of weeks. Um, as I'm sure you know, a decision was made uh, reversing an earlier decision that's gonna keep Lennon Morse campus of the Metro West Medical Center open for the foreseeable future. Uh, open in terms of medical surgical beds and the ICU and the emergency room. And between the Framingham Union campus and the Leonard Moores campus, they are now preparing to essentially double their ICU beds um, from what their current capacity is and to also increase their medical surgical units. Um, they're, we're in constant contact with them. Um, Metro West Medical Center, however, has put out a call to area residents and area businesses um, for certain um, uh, protective equipment that, they're, that they anticipate a need for because they're already running short. And so that through the Chamber of Commerce, they're working with area businesses to try to get donations of that and hopefully that we can get help for them from the federal government and from the state government. Um, but they're doing great work there. And again, I just want to be able to take a few minutes tonight, ask you folks if there's anything specific that I can do for you on behalf of the good people of the town of Sherburn and to let the people of Sherburn know that I'm open, my office is open, and we stand ready, willing, and able to help in any way we want. Thank you for giving me the opportunity tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have. And please, um, if you need me, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, David. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I see Daryl has her hand up. I'm gonna let anybody on the select board, if you'd like to ask some questions of David, start. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. You might need the raise hand option on, on Zoom there. Yeah, David, has the, um, I know right now the uh, governor has expressed that they wanna continue con current construction projects, but the mayor of Boston has given kind of the opposite opinion. Has the legislature even discussed that? Is there any opinion of the legislature about um, current ongoing construction projects? Well, yeah. So um, I can tell you that every member of the legislature was contacted today by the building trades unions and by the AFL-CIO um, asking uh, that the governor shut down all non-essential construction projects. Um, I don't know if we're gonna step into that to be honest with you. Um, obviously, uh, the governor wants to keep things going, but you know, it, um, some decision has to be based on, is it safe for those construction workers to be out on job sites? That's, that's the first responsibility. Um, as of now, you know, the governor has made a decision that as of now, that uh, it is safe, but I can't say that that's gonna hold hold on much longer, to be honest with you. Um, I could also see, quite frankly, the building trades union, if there isn't an official shutdown, doing some type of job action on this. So stand by is, is the bottom line. Thank you. Right, Chuck, I know you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, David, I know Milford's not in your um, district, but the other huge hospital in the area that's relatively close is Milford Wittensville. Do you know what uh, what their status is? Um, on what I haven't. I quite frankly, I haven't been in touch with them. I, you know, obviously, I'm focusing on the on the two that directly serve uh, most of us. Um, they're part of the UMass system. Am I correct? Yeah, but then yeah. just um, graphically. So I, I know that UMass is is in is in pretty good shape. So I'm expecting they're taking care of that. So. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Did you have something? Nope. Okay, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, David, do you have the current status of House uh, 4598? Uh, which bill is that? I don't like numbers. I like, uh, I like what it's about. <laughs> that's the comprehensive one that has the, uh, that's been going back and forth to the Senate and has, yep. the, and has uh, the stuff about uh, postponing tax states and... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, is, it is not on the governor's desk yet. The House um, 
uh, made some changes to it, sent it back to the Senate tomorrow. I, today, the Senate will take it up tomorrow. I think this is going to land on the governor's desk. Tomorrow's Friday. Um, I, I, this will land on the governor's desk by tomorrow afternoon, I expect. And, I, and the issue is not the tax dates. I, I, I think that you guys can count on that the tax dates are, are going to be what they are on the bill. Okay, so the bottom line is, no, it's not signed into law yet. I expect it will be tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Daryl, I know you had a question. Can whoever's moderating this, can you unmute Daryl, please? Who is our moderator? Is it David? I think so. She doesn't show us being muted, I don't think. Oh, there you okay. go, Daryl. There you go. Set. Okay, so uh, since I'm with the Board of Health and we're largely a regulatory board, there are two issues that we're facing in terms of deadlines. One is that we have a regulatory obligation to turn around applications and other issues before the board within a certain number of days. But to do that often requires doing things where maintaining social physical distancing is difficult. Uh, and then the companion piece to that very close is that, again, to, there are people who still want to go ahead with septic repairs and replacements and other things prior to property transfer that were already uh, on en route to, um, to some sort of fixed date. And for the engineers who need to go to the sites and evaluate, we've determined that being outdoors, most people are comfortable with that one can set up systems for that. But there's a lot of work that they have to go inside the house and do inspections. And we feel that's posing a risk both to those professionals and to the homeowners to have that because they don't go in unaccompanied mm -hmm. ever. So we're trying to find a way to lessen the pressure on people to engage in that bad behavior. And I've written to MassDEP to ask if they have any um, technical support that they could provide because right now it would mean be more litigation for the homeowners and that's an added cost mm -hmm. or not litigation but legal uh, support and so that would add to their costs and but mass DEP has a different objective than uh, DPH and for um, you know, there are other areas, the building inspector is impacted, the fire department is impacted. So all of those other departments have different objectives than the DPH. So they're having a hard time just waiving some of those or giving us alternate mechanisms that are robust so that we can make sure that the right things do get done. If we let them through cer certain gates that we have now that ensure that those things get done. Um, you know, by not issuing a permit until every I is dotted and T is crossed. Uh, so that's something we're wrestling with. I could share with your staff things that we've yeah, contemplated yeah. and instituted, uh, if that helps. Um, Dale, no, no, the, only, the only suggestions I would make for you on that would be, you know, obviously do whatever it takes to protect the public health. That's your job number one, okay? And let everything else fall by the wayside, let it be. If there's that specific, means, yeah. if there are specific issues that effectively need um, a temporary legal change in terms of permitting automatic issuance states, although I think we, we've got that covered already in the bill that the governor's gonna sign. Um, please get this very specific request to my office. Okay. Best way is by email. Okay. Right. Because Thank for you, us, those, it's not just extending a permit necessarily. If we issue a permit without doing the checking, that's not in the public interest. No. In the role and of the I, board and of I would not so, recommend you do that. I would yeah. not recommend you do that. Yeah. Okay. I will try to put together something specific that. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Thanks. Right. Do we have any other questions for um, for David Linsky? If not, thank you, David. Okay. And we're going to move forward with our agenda now. 
All right, um, I'm going to sign off and say good night. But if something comes up tonight, would you please just call me or text me, and I'll get back on the, uh, on the call. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, we have our consent agenda with the payroll warrant and the next meeting date of the 23rd. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Before the motion to approve, what happened to the meeting on the 9th? That's next week. Do we really need a meeting next week? Or we could just, I mean, I, I think at this point, the, I know one of the items that was on the agenda originally for the 9th was the developer for Coolidge Street was supposed to come and obviously we can't have an in-person meeting. Um, I think what we wanna to try to do is keep these meeting agendas to, you know, as most urgent business only. Um, so unless you think we need a meeting before, uh, maybe the 16th, that's in two weeks. Maybe we should have plan on that instead of the 23rd, then we can continue on a two, every two week meeting schedule. I don't have kids in school, George. I don't know that it matters anymore, I guess, but is the break week? Is the... Yeah, originally the break week was the week of the 20th, the week of that 23rd, Yeah. but they don't even know. We got a letter from the superintendent today. They may, so the school year doesn't, if, you know, if they're planning on going back, they may go through their online school during the week of the 20th now. Yeah. Um, I think they're trying to figure that out on the state level, yeah. but it doesn't really matter because we're home every week, every day, yeah, most people all are. the time. People are, so, people are going to New Hampshire. I know people that are going to their houses in New Hampshire and th things like that. So. Right. Um, so maybe, how, what does everybody think about the 16th then? That's in two weeks. Yeah. I'm available. Does that work, Chuck? Um, I've got meetings up until about five on the uh, 16th. So the 23rd works a little better, but I can do the 16th. Okay, yeah, it'll be at seven. So hopefully that'll, I think that'll work. And like you, you said, Jeff, in I, case I, people I, were going away, I don't think anyone's going anywhere, but. Yeah, once, you, once you've been in six hours of Zoom meetings, it uh, starts to get counterproductive, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. So is the one for the 23rd officially out? I think we need one or the other. I don't think we need both. Okay, mm -hmm. just on the leading off my calendar. Yeah, I would, let's plan on the 16th. Just a technical question, George Colerance. Yeah. Eric made a reference to a hands up yeah. feature. What is that? Could he explain or you explain? I don't know. I can, if you click under participants, you see a list of all the participants. And there's an option there at the bottom that says raise hand. And whoever moderates it can go through and you select people in order of which their hands are. Yeah, I see Chuck just did it. You, you can do it and whoever moderates can do it. However, I think there's a technical issue. I think David's a moderator. And I think he lost his audio or his, his video. So maybe it's not possible right now, but in the future moving forward, that's how um, I've done quite a few MPO meetings on this at the state level. And it's pretty well run when you do it like that. You can see, uh, see all the raised hands. You can take them in order. You can take members of the board first and so on like that. But it looks like it might not be possible now. So if I go to the end of the list, it's not showing right now on my screen either. It's, I'm not sure how it works with the phones. Yeah, I don't know how it works on the phone. It's a little bit different on the phone app than it is on a laptop. It's a, it's a bottom pull up, pull down menu in the very bottom. So put your cursor at the bottom of all the screens and you'll see participants. Yeah, I see participants and then we're all the way down to the end. I don't see where I can raise my hand. I think what it is, Paul, we're going to leave. I think the moderator has all five of us unmuted and We'll just, if somebody else uh, wants to talk, then they can, well, I'll specifically address them and wait for that, wait for a chance for them to get unmuted. Um, so I guess, so I have full consent, I have a payroll warrant and a meeting date of April 16th. Do I have a um, second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, roll call, Jeff Waldron. Aye. Eric Johnson. Aye. Charles Yon. Aye. Paul Dorensis. Yes. I vote aye, so it's five to zero. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a consideration of revenue tax anticipation note. If the moderator could please unmute Heidi Doyle. Um, Heidi, could you please talk about this? Yes, I just wanted to bring this up in case we need it, and I wanted to go ahead and get the board's approval. As you know, our taxes 
uh, revenue is crucial here coming in in April. Um, with the concern that we've had with the date possibly being, mo being moved and people not knowing, we want to make sure that our revenue still comes in, but we are down to the wire on our resources. So we wanted to be proactive and get the approval to go for a borrowing if we need it. Um, so I had given you the background on what we have. Right now we did have some money come in this week. And so I have most of April's expenses covered with minus the warrant amounts. We don't know what those are, but April um, is okay. May is our huge uh, debt payments as well as, you know, the school assessment and the school capital debt payment. So I just would like a motion to be able to go for borrowing up to a certain amount or as needed. And we can address it at the next meeting again to where we stand. Okay, thanks, Heidi. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Heidi on that? I know it was in the packet. Um, and Heidi, do, do we incur any costs in, in starting the process? Is there, until we pull the trigger, are there any costs, depending on what the uh, revenue receipts look like? When, no. when, we, when does it start costing us money to do a, a tax anticipation note? The only time it'll cost us money is when we finally uh, talk to our fiscal advisors to say, let's go for bid. But preparation right now is um, basically, I'm watching daily, but you know, Sharon and I have been in, in touch and I kind of feel by the end of next week, we're gonna know where we look with some of the money coming in. And I don't an anticipate needing a full amount that I have down, but we might need something if we don't see the revenue coming in by the third week of April. Uh, so we don't incur any costs until they actually prepare it for us. Would it require a, an additional vote of the board to approve the TAN, the tax anticipation notice? Uh, I think at this point, I would think no, that you would, we would just approve to go for it. If you're okay with leaving the amount up to a certain amount or flexible on the amount. Uh, my concern is uh, authorizing without having any idea what the costs are. Right. The cost to go for it to the cost to go right i won't have the interest costs until we know what the amount is and what i'm hearing is interest has been all over right now it's it's we hear the fed rates are so low but i've heard that not everyone is getting that on their borrowings so i'm hoping we don't need this i just want to be proactive well if i could make a suggestion uh, george yes go ahead paul i'm sorry if we have a meeting on the 16th, is it possible to make this decision on the 16th and have more answers to Chuck's question by then? Or uh, does it really have to be done today? No, the 16th is fine. Initially, I had the 23rd down as the next meeting. I just wanted to uh, go ahead and have you approve me looking into borrowing. I have, no problem. I have no problem with that. It's just I don't want to authorize it in advance without knowing the parameters of the dollar amount, the interest, the cost. Right. Exactly. I think I think we can you could go ahead and look into it, but then on the 16th we would actually vote to authorize it. I think that's that's fair. You know, I was hoping to have a firm number next time. Okay. Perfect. I'd move to uh, authorize uh, <clears throat> the planning and preparation for a tax anticipation note of up to $6 million, subject to final approval by the select board. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right, uh, Mr. Waldron? I think he's frozen. <laughs> Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Jan? Aye. Mr. Drenzis? Aye. I vote aye, well, Jeff will vote later or we'll just say four zero at this point because he has to abstain because his, his video is frozen um all right thank you heidi you're welcome uh next on the agenda is consideration of road improvement plan chapter 90 projects sean killeen i think sean's on here somewhere if the moderator could unmute sean first time we've ever had trouble hearing from sean <laughs> uh, 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 I can hear him out my window. <laughs> yeah. Let's go all open our windows and hear what he has to say. 
be patient for a second. David, are you getting to Sean? So sometimes when the moderator unmutes someone, depending on how the meeting was set up, the person may also need to unmute. Oh, okay. Sean, if you're muted yourself, please unmute. Someone's sending a message. Okay. <clears throat> There George, is. can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I'm sorry. I'm trying to listen in. Sean? Yeah, what did I miss? I, I was trying to listen to CONCON at the same time. Oh, no problem. Well. Um, we're just to your agenda item for the consideration of road improvement, improvement plan, Chapter 90 projects. Okay. Um, so I wish I could share my screen, but it, I don't have it up. But in your packet, I believe you guys got the preliminary estimate. I didn't bury it with all the chapter 90 uh, paperwork, but so there's an estimate to do um, Pleasant Street. Pleasant Street, if anyone has driven down it in the past 15 years, is uh, in worse shape than Green Lane and Rockwood Street, uh, although it used to be paved. Um, it's, it's in real bad shape. What, what I've been able to do, um, partially because of the situation with, with construction is uh, kind of identify one, at least one project that I can do. It doesn't take a lot of work out ahead of it for my crew or other crews. That road needs to be completely reclaimed um, and repaved. Uh, and of course, there's not an extensive amount of drainage structures or any other utilities on the road. So, um, what I did, and it also happens to line up with the fisc, what's left of the fiscal 2020 chapter 90 money. So it's not just committed, but it's committed and basically essentially in the bank. Fiscal 2021, we can talk about later, that's committed, but the bond bill hasn't been signed. Uh, so what I'm asking for is uh, approval to start that project. Uh, the contractors are eager to, to jump on a project. Um, we, we have it, you know, active contracts with PJ Keating. They're starting up their plant and they're ready to go, but a lot of their projects are falling through. So we could potentially have it done in the next couple of weeks. This is this, Sean, is this a good time to talk about trying to spend some of the 2021 money? I mean, if, if we've got contractors available, this, the, the, Traffic has got to be as, as, as low as it's going to be in a, in a long time. Um, isn't there, I, my recollection is there's a pathway to, to spend anticipated 2021 Chapter 90 money. I thought we did this. Well, it is. And I, on, a, on a normal year, matter of fact, what was, what was slated for me, um, had this not all happened, was the last meeting or the meeting prior, I was going to bring... Um, a handful of projects that, that also would have already had firmer numbers, this being one and several others. There's a handful of roads I want to do, similar to how we did um, Hunting Lane and Nason Hill. They want to get shimmed and chip sealed. And uh, just the way the construction works out, the shimming happens. Um, the big road crews start up in the spring and they can come into town and hit that stuff. And then they go off and do their highway work for most of the summer. So we always have a window where we can jump on it. Um, that's lagged a little because of what's going on and no one could come out and look at anything. We're, that's starting to pick back up. So within the next week or two, I could have some pretty firm numbers on a, several other roads that would basically finish out the 2021 money. And of course, you know, I was, you know, we were, we were going to town meeting with, with an ask too. So we won't get into that, but it, would be a good time to consider that. And what happens is, um, and we've done this in the past, I'm sure Framingham does this all the time, I'm not sure, but 
what we do is we have a commitment letter already from MassDOT for the 2021 money. It's always, for us, it's always about 260000 That doesn't become money that we can get our hands on until 21, 2021 starts, which is no earlier than obviously July 1st. But, you know, sometimes the bond bills take a little while to get signed. So typically what you do is you borrow in anticipation. You know you're going to get the money. You want to schedule the work. You borrow in anticipation to cover the bills that come in. And then it gets, you know, obviously re, uh, re, repaid as soon as the uh, the Chapter 90 money is actually available. Usually those notes are enough to actually uh, pull a short-term borrowing. That's correct. My question is, I have a question, Eric, for you. With the question you asked David Linsky, like, is there a chance that they're going to shut, will they shut down road construction projects? It doesn't sound it. It, the way he's making it sound, it sounds like the legislature is not going to make a move on it. The governor has made an opinion, and I don't see that changing. The controversial ones that I've seen, particularly in Framingham, have been the indoor jobs. We have to have an inspector go inside and look at plumbing, look at whatever. And that's the stuff for people. The outdoor stuff doesn't seem as controversial right now, but that's just the sense I'm getting. I just wanted to ask the question. I, I think it, it makes sense. I mean, if they're working outside, it shouldn't be... I wouldn't think it would be too much of a problem. And, and as Chuck said, it's a probably the lowest traffic time, right? And did most yeah. least disruptive time to be, we're doing road work. So it's probably a good idea. I agree. If, if I could, would that, uh, go morning. ahead, Paul. So the, the, the governor has issued, uh, as you might know, a revised set of what's essential and not essential up two days ago. And today they issued guidelines on that those construction projects that are allowed to proceed, including a category that is labeled DPW construction projects, public works construction projects. And there are all kinds of protocols that need to be followed. So I want to be sure that number one, uh, we're aware of these things. And number two, that Sean is aware of these things. They just came down. Uh, I think today on the guidelines for the allowed, what's allowed for construction. Essentially, the, the governor's closing down all commercial construction unless necessary for the COVID response, but the residential piece he's allowing to proceed because he says there's a housing crisis in the Commonwealth. So, yeah, I think we can, just make sure also, everybody you're seeing the chats on the side. Daryl is muted, but she typed in that that's in line with the policy and procedures issued by the Board of Health for town inspectors. So I just want to share that in case you missed it. But Daryl's unmuted now. So Daryl, did you want to make any comment or? Uh, no, that related to what Eric was talking about, just the, the outdoor activities being, as I typed after, outdoor is easier to address safely with certain rules that we provided um, for the different departments that deal with outdoor inspections, but the indoor is where it's very rare that you'd have the right mix of circumstances so that it would be safe. And that's okay. where we're running into trouble. Okay, Chuck? The old fashioned raising hand. <laughs> um, to argue against doing the anticipation of the 2021 funding is there's discussion at the federal level, yet again, for like the third year in a row about infrastructure funding. I suspect that will apply to bridge and broadband, much bigger projects. But if it did include road paving in Sherburne, that would be an argument against not doing it, waiting mm -hmm. to see if there is going to be that uh, uh, finally an infrastructure bill out of Washington. Eric? Well, I guess I have a question for Sean about the specific project, proposed project. I have a couple of technical questions about um, the chip seal over the pavement, but I'll be interested in the projects which he's still getting cost estimates on. Because in general, and I'm referring to the, um, the Green International Pavement Study that uh, Sean provided in the fall, and it's a very good study. Um, I always buy a thing what's called level three and level four uh, uh, roadway work, because those are the roads that haven't fallen apart yet and that working on them now will save money in the future. Um, this road is basically a level five, so it's falling apart. Not that you want to, you can defer it, 
because it's not going to change over any significant amount of time. It's as bad as it gets. And you're and one year or five years from now, you're still doing a reclaim. No matter what you're doing, you're doing a base rehab, you're doing a reclaim. And I'm curious to Sean about the projects he's proposing to get. Are any of those level three or level four projects that he might get cost estimates on next week? I'm Eric, I'm glad can you hear me guys? Yep. Yep. I'm glad you asked that. So a couple things. One, um Eric might be the only one looking at that chart, but just so you know, the reason Pleasant Street doesn't show up in their cost estimate is, is basically that reason. They said that anything that needed a serious rebuild, they didn't really put into the plan. They were going to let us address that. Um, and, and I would say that to, to answer the second part of your question, all the other roads I'm looking at fit into that category of, of the like the, kind of the three to four, not even three to four, really probably high twos into threes. Um, there that you're there, your Lake Street, uh, some of Western Ave. It's the roads I can't, we can't afford to lose. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try and save them. This one in particular, uh, and, and I've made that same case a couple times about the road you already lost. You already lost. Uh, there's there's two reasons to that. One, uh, especially with our, you know, we're pretty light on our crew. It's really labor intensive to keep a road. Uh, that's in that bad a shape drivable. I know of one person that's on this call that whose wife lost a tire on that road. We put 15 tons of material on that road filling potholes last year. We literally just dumped the truck and kept going. So there's, you know, you have to keep it drivable. Um, and then, so the, the other part of that is right now, we're so light on our crew and, and behind, I mean, I basically shut the place down for a week. We came back, we're sweeping. I'm trying to keep everyone away from each other. We can't be doing any prep work on stuff. We, I don't, I mean, I assume we're going to go get the baseball fields ready at some point. Uh, so we're really, we're pretty shorthanded anyway. So this project works perfect because a contractor could literally show up tomorrow and it's ready a week from now and it's ready. There's no real, out front work that we have to do. Whereas with the chip ceiling and some of the other major roads, say we went to do a piece of Western Ave, there's, there's structures that need to be probably fixed and rebuilt. My face isn't there. Okay. Um, Eric? Just one more. So I get that. That makes sense. That does make sense. So my only technical question is, do any heavy trucks drive on that? Mm -hmm. Do I question the... Uh, it, the whole structural aspect is going to be two and a half inches of binder. And usually you see that covered with some top. Um, I find it different, but maybe it's enough. The two and a half inches of binder with the double stone chip seal, you know, would be enough if it's just residential cars. Do any trucks go to the farm there? Are there any truck traffic on that road? Um, my, uh, well, my, my dog and I may be the best to be able to answer that since we've talked about this <laughs> all the time. It is a very narrow, um, I've never seen anything beyond a pickup truck on it. Okay. Your headphones go? I don't think we're going to listen to it. Right. Whoever Gavin is, can you please mute? I'm talking about like trails and trucks or whatever. Thank you. Um, all right. Do, do we have a motion? I guess. Does anybody have any other questions for Sean? Actually, I got another comment for Eric's question. Okay. Um, I don't have it in front of me. But there, there was a handful of roads back in the day that we did just like that. That wasn't, a, I, I wish I could take credit for that idea. Uh, but that was something common they did in the late 80s when they rebuilt a bunch of roads in town. They put a big, heavy, thick base on it uh, after they reclaimed. Of course, back then they were reclaiming the cold in place because it, that was the first generation road after they took a dirt road and just shot it with oil. But, um, they left the base there. They put two and a half inches on it. Uh, you get good strength out of a two and a half inch binder, of course. Uh, and then they and then they shot chip seal over it to make it look like a nice country road. And it, and the double chip seal, which I'm using there, also does a good job of uh, kind of. It's a self healing road, basically. If if, the, if any cracks do propagate up through that base, um, you know, the first few warm days, and we'll see that on Hunting Lane and Nason Hill as well. Uh, it, it starts to actually heal itself. And in the chip seal on top of fresh asphalt, it'll dig in pretty good. 
Right. And it won't be immediate. You know, it's going to sit as blacktop for a little while. We'll let it, it's going to age for a month or two because uh, the oils have to come out of it. But we'll probably get them in in the summer, I would hope. Okay. I see Chuck. Go ahead, Chuck. Where are we on the uh, anticipation of the 2021 funding? Do we want to do that? Consider that as well? Because what you've proposed so far, Sean, the 108173 that's existing. That's 2020 appropriations, correct? Right. And, I, and I'm not prepared to propose the others. What I would be prepared is just to ask if, if there's a consensus of the board that I should pursue it. Because, if you know, if the board were to say, you know what, Sean, just go away for six months, I'll go away. And I'll do this one. Uh, but if, you know, if, if there's an appetite and it looks like it's going to happen, the, the opening is there with the, with the construction crews. So now would be the time I'd spend the next week or two working on it. I'd come back to you with X, Y, and Z. Uh, I think it makes sense for you to look into it. And I think tonight we could vote on this, this particular project on Pleasant Street and then come back to us in two weeks and look at and let us know what you've found about the 2021 okay we might i'm wondering uh george i'm wondering if we need to find out the road crews can separate but i'm wondering about the asphalt plants if they how intense and close proximity the asphalt plants are sean they're working they're opening up i are think they? i think the lunenburg pj heating plant opened today they gotta once they're open they gotta haul asphalt and okay. and I'm yep. pretty sure the governor made it pretty clear that the public works projects are going to start. Thanks. And no one should stand in the way of getting them done. Paul, did you have a comment? I was going to make a motion. Okay, go ahead. So I was going to make the motion that George, you just said, <laughs> which is to approve the Pleasant Street project to go forward and to request the DPW director to bring forward at our meeting on April 16th plans for the remaining amounts for 2021 road work. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Jan? Yes. Mr. Dorensis? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. I vote aye, so 5-0. Thanks, Sean. Um, sorry, I just got to scroll back to my agenda. The next item on our agenda, number four, is COVID-19 team update with Zach Ward. Um, David, could you make sure Zach – oh, Zach is unmuted. Great. So, Zach, if you want to give us an update, that would be great. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm having some connection issues. I actually cannot see any of you, but I can hear all of you, which, which is what counts. So, uh, we'll – We'll continue on here. Um, so as, as you all know, um, we formed a team when this became a threat for the town of Sherman, consisting of fire, police, Board of Health, Emergency Management, DPW, uh, the COA, Finance Department, uh, the town administrator, and, and representatives from uh, the select board. So we're hard at work. Uh, right now, we're communicating as a group at least twice per week, although many of us uh, communicate every day. Um, Many different aspects are happening to respond to this, this pandemic. It's, it's funny, when you think about all different disciplines working together, um, you know, this is, this is certainly one of those situations where we're literally, you know, asking for assistance from, from all corners of, of town government uh, mm -hmm. for some of these issues that come up. Um, <clears throat> some of our challenges are, are including um, the, re the both police and fire response to emergencies, um, any medical emergencies that come up, support for residents that need it. Uh, the COA is, is working on that. Um, of course, we've, we've had to take action on certain issues that have um, come up, such as uh, recommendations as far as closing certain facilities, such as playgrounds or the tennis courts or, or uh, uh, even town hall. Um, still working on updating plans. We did. Um, finish the town's uh, coup plan or con continu uh, con continuity of operations plan. Um, and we are working on other plans. Uh, really, at this point, we're responding to this issue 
in the present mode in, in the next couple of weeks, but we're also looking up to a year out because as, as you may uh, have seen in the media, this thing could come back in the fall and the winter. So we're kind of looking ahead to that too, um, which would be, it would certainly be great if it didn't happen, but uh, we need to be ready as a community. So we're working on that. Um, and of course we're still, you know, as we're doing all this, trying to inform the public, we, I think on the March 12th or March 10th, we uploaded a page on the website, on the town website. We're actually uh, making some big changes to that page uh, tonight as we speak uh, to make it a little more user friendly for the residents. And that's all I have for now. Daryl, um, would you like to chime in? Daryl's kind of heading this up as well. Yeah, I'll mention that the uh, website is being updated to make it more usable because we need to keep adding more and more information to it as as things move on and we have the time to create more content or identify additional content that's needed. So, um, let's see. It's so fast moving, it's almost, sometimes I feel like it's pointless to try to review where we've been because we've just been sprinting after um, this thing. And as Zach said, looking ahead to the future and can we get as ready as we can be for what might come next. We're getting reports from doctors and folks at hospitals that it might be another two weeks before we really start hitting uh, the real surge. So or the problematic surge, we're already surging. If you look at any of the graphs, they're nearly vertical in terms of increases in cases. Uh, on the website, I don't know if it's on there yet, um, but there is a link or potentially there's a link in some directions on how you can go and you can see where the cases are in Massachusetts and the breakdowns by, uh, they're by county, they're by age group, they're by gender and uh, some other criteria in there too. So um, we're really, I think the hardest part of this is how to get people to do what they should be doing to protect themselves. And beyond that, if they're not worried individually is to protect everyone. And as much as you can, if you can get that message out and make people realize that even if they're not worried about COVID-19 affecting them seriously, uh, health-wise, that if they break a leg or their kid breaks a leg during this time, they may not get adequate medical care and that may have to be put off or a burst appendix or any other thing that is a serious medical condition. There just won't be the capacity at the hospitals to deal with it because they're gonna be filled up by COVID-19. So uh, that's the thing we struggle with all the time is how to help people understand that. Um, again, we don't feel that our numbers in town would be compelling to make people do that. And the numbers, the testing rates are low. People are only really getting tested <clears throat> if they show um, symptoms that are strong, not just the symptoms, but a number of combination of factors. So there's a list of criteria by which they'll uh, authorize a test, again, because they're in limited number and the turnaround times and all the other issues with it. So for the most part, if people are contacting their doctors with some symptoms and they're not at the point yet of being having respiratory distress, then they're just being asked to behave as if they have COVID and to stay home. Uh, for the most part. So, um, so anyway, we have to assume, forget what the numbers are, it's in our community. The numbers are high enough in Eastern Massachusetts that there is absolutely no way it is not all around us. Uh, so we're working on that. I guess a, a unusual issue that came to my attention today is, I think someone perhaps from Chickering School contacted Dover Town Government to say that they're looking at the idea of having a teacher's parade in Dover and Sherborne. So just to put that on your radar, I've only heard that the idea has been floated. I just responded saying, what would their 
vision be for maintaining physical social distancing for both the folks in the parade and for onlookers. So, uh, and maybe there are other ways to approach it, rather, other to approach the uh, dynamic of having some connection between teachers and students be maintained. So, on that, I'll update Darryl, you as that as more comes available on that. Darryl, one thing, uh, on that, Daryl, um, just so you know, from perspective of a parent. Um, the schools are doing a great job, the teachers communicating with the kids over Zoom. My daughter has a meeting, my fifth grader has a meeting every day. They're actually at Pine Hill, just for everybody's knowledge, they're still doing all school meetings on Friday over Zoom. So that's been, that's been fantastic for the kids uh, to connect with their friends. Um, they're better at this technology stuff than we are. So uh, Jeff, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I can comment on both those things. So Daryl, I was just adding to Daryl's thing. I'm not wild about this parade idea either, but it was based on a Norwood parade that was yesterday. And the parade was teachers in their own cars, one person per car. So they weren't walking in the street. The teachers were driving by the cars, but it only works in a neighborhood. They're, they were basically going through fairly um, dense neighborhoods in Norwood and the families were in their own driveways, but not mingling with other um, families. That doesn't work in a town like Dover and Sherburn where right. you're on Farm Road and Maple Street or whatever you're on, you know. So I could foresee that then people would, if they want to see the parade, you know, I live off of Ivy, so it's a denser neighborhood. People would go to their friends' houses, which we certainly wouldn't want. So no. right. anyway, and that's, that's what I was, would parade. Yeah, I was concerned about that as well. And for the ones that I watched online, just to see how people had implemented it. I also noticed that there were, sometimes those cars in the parade were packed with people, yes. which again, you mentioned one person per car, but yeah. multiple people is not the point either. So I, I think it's important that we're always demonstrating the behavior that we wanna see people carrying out. So anyway, but there may be some other ways. It's great to hear that I'm glad those Friday school meetings were wonderful at Pine Hill. So yeah, that's Kelly great. Hodge. Kelly Hodge is a music teacher and she's doing a fantastic job trying to run a meeting of 400 kids <laughs> online. Um, uh, does anybody else have any questions for the group, Chuck? Yeah, well, first of all, having four or five people in a car sounds like social non-distancing. That sounds like a, <laughs> not a pretty good idea. Question for Zach and, uh, and Daryl. I, the, state numbers have been aggregated by county. I've seen a couple of articles where they've been talking about town specific numbers. Um, I don't know where they're getting them or if these are, uh, can you comment on that? Because I've had a couple people ask me what's going on in Sherbert. And um, so I, I, I just, I, I've told okay. them that the state numbers are aggregated. It's, I'll know, defer that to Daryl. She's a little bit better yep. to answer yes, that. We, uh, we have enormous discussions on this. So the Department of Public Health has a very strong preference. And it was a rule, they've softened during this period, but very strong preference that people not release numbers on a town by town basis. And part of that is for <laughs> confidentiality reasons for the individuals who may be affected. And that's a long standing practice because we can, the, the Board of Health can see those numbers and our public health nurse knows the numbers and is tracking cases for infectious diseases. So this is just one of many infectious diseases get, that get tracked by the state and then by the towns. So uh, one is that confidentiality issue and then the other, as I mentioned, is in some respect, a town by town number is meaningless because it could just be quirks of some dynamic of where the borders are or where a particular incident might have happened where testing was done. So if you look at the, um, at the Mass DEP, uh, DPH rather, website that daily gives updates on the counts of positive tests and on the numbers who have been tested across the state by county. We're up to 
in Middlesex County is getting close to 2,000 positive cases. And uh, Norfolk County is around 1,000. And um, it's rather close. Suffolk County is also getting close to 2,000. So there is no way that Sherborne does not have cases. So to give a number, it, it's not going to people should be doing the safe behavior now. They should not base it on whether the number is one or five or 18 or 53 or 200 or a thousand. They should be doing the same thing anyway. So. And on that note, I mean, if anybody's going to a grocery store, you're going to Natick, you're going to Ashland, you're going to Medfield. So as I think your point's well taken, Daryl, that the town numbers are meaningless and uh, independently. And and if you practice the, um, you know, we hear it from doctors over and over, the physical distancing and hand washing are key. They are key in this. And you can be quite safe if you practice these things religiously. So. And just if I could add just another part to this that I forgot to mention, the communication with some of our surrounding communities has been wonderful. Uh, the Board of Health has been working very closely with the Dover Board of Health. Uh, just, you know, I've been talking to area fire chiefs and emergency management directors multiple times a day. Uh, so we're all kind of in this together as a, as a, you know, a lot of small communities in the area and some, some larger ones too with Framingham and Natick, but we're all collectively working together on this. Um, We've, you know, with Frank, especially Framingham and Natick, um, we've worked on a number of things such as such as PPE and and um, uh, areas to quarantine first responders. Just a number of different issues. Uh, and again, just like I said at, at your meeting, I think it was four weeks ago. I still believe that that Sherburn um, was was well prepared uh, for this. Although, you know, this is something we just kind of never expected. I do think uh, we were again, way ahead of some other communities with our, with our group and, and all the work that, that has been done. And I still think that, so. All right. Marion, did you have a comment? That, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Marion. Okay. Um, I had a, a specific question for you, Daryl and, and Zach, uh, that was raised in my mind when we got that uh, email notice about the postal worker that tested positive. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was handled properly and you certainly don't want to identify a person. Uh, but it raised the question in my mind as, as to, well, you know, that postal worker <clears throat> had been quarantined for some time, which means that he was infectious at some point that we don't know. And I think a lot of people have questions, including me, about uh, if we assume that a postal worker could be infectious but you know non-symptomatic nobody's getting tested to speak of so uh as you say it's all around us um we all take our precautions but there are some weak points that is our mail being one of them and i know uh we're getting reassurances that the mail is safe etc but i must say uh you know uh, having worked with viruses in my lab I know how they stick around on services and what you have to do. So I wonder if it might be um, good to add to your advice to the town to just take care with anything that's, you know, from somewhere else and has been handled by someone else, including groceries and mail and everything else. So uh, I think it might be useful for people just to have some ideas from you on what are some good rules to follow. Okay, so I will say I, re I spend all day on meetings, researching things, communicating with others, um, but really a lot of, of what I do is try to keep up with any new information that's coming out about this. But there is a, a tremendous amount that's firm and known absolutely. Uh, so I, I see that there are ranges, you know, as you talk about how long do things survive on surfaces, there are ranges that are out there of what people have studied and found. Also, the way that this uh, 
has affected uh, populations is it's just so fast and people are so busy that collecting some of that data, it's just, it's not possible at the moment. Oh, right. No, really, no, and firm things up. But right. so what we have on the website uh, are links to CDC and WHO and DPH. Those three websites do have information about that. I will tell you, people have to read a bunch and find what's their comfort level because there is a lot of different guidance. Don't worry about the mail. Quarantine your mail for a couple of days before you, you deal with it and open it. Just throw, wear a glove, throw it in a box. Do people know how to wear gloves properly and how to take them off properly? You know, there's so many layers to all of this. So um, yeah, what we I, have heard from folks is that, uh, again, if there is something about the loading, which you must be familiar with, of the amount of time you're going to spend with someone. So if at the post office, the counter's fairly deep, there's equipment in between, normally you should be some amount, a, a distance away from uh, the workers there. You're not handling so much. And if you do hand washing, you should largely be protected, which goes to we need to be protected all the time because, right, asymptomatic people, you're not going to know that you're getting affected by them or that they're carrying the virus. So, and they don't right. know. And just um, if I could, Mary, that's an absolutely wonderful point. You know, part of the challenges for us in, in, the, in the community that we're in is this, this whole situation is just changing so rapidly. So, you know, for instance, our, the guidance on how we respond to ambulance calls uh, literally has changed three times this week and, and what we're supposed to wear and what we're supposed to do. So, so again, like, like Daryl said, a lot of our efforts have been like sharing the, the links for the, you know, so the experts can tell you um, what we should be doing. And, and also they're updating those sites regularly. And that's, that's and just kind of the way that we, we that felt was best to get the word out. Yeah, and, and I follow those sites. I think a lot of people do. Uh, but I think if, if there's any opportunity uh, for leaders in the town like you to um, raise, uh, that is to be really definite with people, uh, to assume that anything that anyone else has touched could be contaminated and just use that as a personal guide, you know, and you can go to the CDC and everything and nobody can tell you exactly how to behave. But I think uh, we can be extra cautious in Sherburne. You know, we have people with a lot of medical knowledge, a lot of basic science knowledge, people like me who are scared shitless of viruses because I've worked with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am now. So, you know, when, when my friends ask me, well, should I do this or should I do that? I read them the riot act. Uh, and I'm going to continue to do that. I'm not saying that you should necessarily, but it's good to be really definite in your instructions because people are pretty confused. <laughs> so one of the things that we hope we'll be posting um, with the revised website is a link to a video by a doctor, I think in New York, who shows how to handle groceries that have been dropped off at your home Michigan. Uh, and goes all through it. Yeah. And it is, uh, right, it's exemplary about what the procedures would be. And there are a lot of good tips in there. People may not choose to implement all of them. Uh, we do see often references to that the transmission by touching surfaces may not be as great, but I think sometimes that's in the context of or from hospital doctors who were in the wards with people. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes relative. So for us, it might be the touching that is our biggest risk factor. And then once you start getting into these nuances, it gets harder to figure out how to connect. Oh, absolutely. That. That's exactly. my point. That's my point, uh, you know, to sort of uh, uh, avoid, avoid too much nuance in your, in your messages. Right. Even but, if you err on the side of being draconian, and uh, you know it's the right way to to err. That's all. And so this video was nice for that reason. 
Uh, I will say the Council on Aging's, uh, both Dover and Sherborne, prepared something that is being distributed by the volunteers who are helping to deliver food to seniors, and it's going out to them in mm -hmm. particular. So, oh, well, um, but you. if you would like to get that, you could get it from them. But, you know, again, everybody's going to look and have a different opinion. I have a different opinion about maybe what the information would be in there and everyone has their own take and that's where it starts <coughs> getting tricky because I am not oh, of course. So right. it's a matter of what information, you know, we're putting on our website. Um, there's lots of a big range of information out there. That's my only yeah. comment. So thank you. Yeah. Back. And then we have people arguing on the other side, things like the tennis court should be open because people are apart. We're like, well, they're sharing a ball constantly. Mm -hmm. Oh, fabric doesn't hold on to it. But if you read deeper into it, some of the, the issues around fabric are twofold. One, it's multi-layered. So some of the virus particles, right, work their way down. So it's not as immediate a contact as a smooth surface. And then the, but it's still there. And then the other factor is that mm. there's a thought that fabric promotes drying of the virus, which will kill it off. Um, right. And all and of And it might depend on the type of fabric because synthetics may not dry as the same way that an, uh, cotton fabric might. Or something. Right. Which is why you need just a, you know, uh, really strong basic practices and, you yeah without worrying about all those details. Yeah. Chuck, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to reinforce what uh, Marion is saying. Uh, first of all, Marion, I think the viruses are just as scared of you as you are of them, but that's a different <laughs> issue. Um, <laughs> that video that Daryl's talking about, I think it's a doctor in Michigan, kind of a scruffy, bearded guy. Yeah. Uh, it's terrific. And what's so good about it is, to Marion's point, it's very clear. It's very direct. You should do this. You might want to do this, but it's it, we don't need complexity. And if if, you, if the board of health thinks it's good, I think putting a link to that. I think this in the COA package they may have a link to it, but it's a very good um, and useful information. Um, I do in favor. No, we do want to get that up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I want to keep moving here if we can, unless there's anything else on the update. Um, our next part is actually has to do with this as well. The next item on our agenda is consideration of an action item to whether to declare a local emergency. I know Jeff and Zach had prepared some slides for this. So if, Jeff, did you want to share those? Uh, yeah, I'll do that. And Zach, maybe you want to start and then we can go through the slides. Is that all right? Absolutely. And again, I cannot see the slides uh, right now. Because uh, my... Neither can I just yet. Hang on a second. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the questions come up um, in our work group and uh, by a number of residents uh, regarding the, the local declaration of a state of emergency, okay? And some of the questions have been, hey, you know, all these other towns are doing this, why isn't sure and so on, and <clears throat> including um, from, from some town employees. Um, so as a group, we discussed it, uh, some of the pros and cons, which I think, which I think Selectman Waldron has in his, on his slides. Does that see um, that now? Yep. Yes. Um, but we've kind of gone back and forth. The work group um, was supportive of it. I'm supportive as the, the uh, interim emergency management director um, for, for a number of reasons, which, which I think you'll see on the slides. Um, but one of, the, one of the larger reasons is the message to the community. Um, there are, as we talked about with the number of cases in town, there are some people um, in the community that simply um, are not taking this seriously because, you know, they think that it's not insurable. And so we're trying to really come up with a unified message that this is a, a serious situation. And, and we certainly think that this declaration will, will help with that, but that is not the, uh, the main reason why we're doing that. But I, I think Jeff could kind of go through the slides a little bit better than I can, because I just simply cannot see them right now. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to it and then uh, we, people can chime in. Uh, so I have three slides. First slide was just some of the research I did. And I know we've gotten, uh, Paul has a lot of knowledge in this area and we've gotten input from KP Law. But these were some of the items that I identified as a, uh, a possible reason why towns would declare a local state of emergency. Um, 
And as you'll see when I get to the second slide, I, to a large extent, we probably can already do most of these things without declaring an emergency, but there's benefits to doing it. Um, one is putting the head of emergency management, which is Zach in our town, uh, fully in charge without any kind of bureaucratic hurdles. We can actually require people to isolate or quarantine, not that we're able to uh, probably implement that without being able to monitor it. Um, one area uh, which Dave, I'm not sure if Dave Sawson is on from the Board of Health, but one area that I think is actually something that we should think about, I think it's one, one of the two stronger reasons for declaring a state of emergency, is you can allow medical professionals that are licensed elsewhere to practice, but you can also have healthcare volunteers handle low level medical tasks with a professional supervising them. So if we get in a situation like um, we've had some of our emergency responders in quarantine because they had a potential exposure. If we're low on um, police and EMTs, we may at some point, if it gets um, more intense, we may need to supplement our first responders with some other kind of resource. It could be retired doctors in town or uh, nurses in the town. So um, that's one uh, ability that this allows. It'll, it allows deficit spending for budgets, but I think we already have that as we've identified, uh, identified already have that power. And it can accelerate procurement decisions. Uh, I just gave the example here what happened in Washington, but you know, if we need to make a uh, 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 pretty um, immediate decision on some potential acquisition, um, it allows us to do that. So I'm gonna go down to the second slide where it kind of then shifted to pros and cons. I said that uh, the pros that we, we, it strengthens us our physical distancing because we can mandate compliance, but we don't have the ability to monitor that really. But we are, the police are checking on things. You know, when we uh, uh, initially um, started our COVID team, the, the playgrounds were open. And so then we closed the playgrounds because we looked behind the, police station or the fire station and there's 21 cars in the playground. So, um, you know, then we, uh, it was not until a day or two later that we closed the tennis courts and we have signs as you've probably seen on Laurel Field. Um, the trustees of the reservation sort of officially closed the reservations, but you know, there's obviously no locked gates so people can still hike, but we're trying to very, very much cause there to be physical distancing. And we had a citizen in town actually uh, ask us to reinforce the leash laws because one thing that was happening if people would be walking and staying physically apart but if your dog goes up to another dog you have to get close to another person in order to separate the dogs so we want to reinforce the leash law um, i said that the emergency declaration allows us to deficit spend but massachusetts has already given us that power to do that i already talked about the health care volunteers and the um, uh, decisions so, so I think it, the way I put it in the summary at the bottom is that I don't myself see a major benefit of the declaration. The two benefits I see are the, the uh, I don't see there's any drawbacks to doing it either. And it sends a strong signal to the residents. And I think the point about the healthcare permits uh, for you know, people that could help contribute to the team um, could be a, a reason to do it. And then my third slide, a lot of towns have done it, not that we have to copy everyone, but this is a map showing the state of Massachusetts and the towns in yellow have declared local states of emergency. So you can see it's a fair number of towns that have done that. Um, so we also have, I, I uh, have the file, I didn't um, print it on the screen, but we have, as an example, we have Winchester's uh, declaration. So we know, you know, the language that their Board of Health used to issue their declaration. So that's all I have to say. Do you want to add anything, Zach? Yeah, so we do have Winchesters and a few others. Um, and again, like just to, to, to emphasize what, what Jeff said, um, you know, again, there's, there's really no drawback. There are some, uh, some minor benefits, but again, this, this I think, the work group, as we stated, it, it sends a strong signal to the residents that we're all active, we're all working together, and that this is absolutely uh, a serious situation in the town. And, and that's 
you know, those are some of the major benefits to me. Daryl, do you want to? Um... Just a second, Jeff. Can you take down your screen so I can see more people, just in case somebody's trying to raise their hand or something? Thank you. Yeah. Is that all right? Yep, that's better. Okay, so the one thing I would, oh dear, it just went out of my head. Oh, the one thing I'd add is that if we're not publicizing the numbers of the cases in Sherborne, and let me be frank here without divulging anything and say that if the number was a thousand, I think that might be better to publicize as being inspirational, but we're not close to that. So maybe declaring this would be inspirational for people to accept that it's here and they really have to get serious about um, doing the right things. Chuck, go ahead. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, the, where did the sample declaration of emergency that's in our packet come from? And this follow-on question to that is, it refers to, there's several of the recital clauses refer to the Board of Health having determined that COVID-19 presents a major disaster. So the first question is to Daryl, whether or not that has happened and whether or not we can use it. And then a follow-on question for Chief Bento, uh, which is, I'm interested in his opinion on the declaration of an emergency. Okay, you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, the if board you can has get Chief Bento unmuted, that would be good. Okay. And the Board of Health hasn't discussed this explicitly, but I don't believe there's anyone on the board who does not think that this is an emergency. But I could always convene the Board of Health if for you, you know, for you to take this step if you choose to. Uh, I could convene an emergency meeting quite quickly and take a vote on that. Lieutenant Bento? Yes. Do you have anything to add to that? I've been discussing with uh, with the group, with Daryl and, and with Zach and everyone else, and uh, I certainly agree that, um, like what Daryl said, that if we give out a low number, we're, we're sending that message. Uh, and I think it is an emergency, so I, I would fully support that if everybody okay. agrees. Anybody else on the board have questions, comments? Uh, Darren, go ahead. I was just going to say, I believe the one in your pack is is a sample that we've been sending around to many of our cities and towns, many of which um, have declared. I, I will say that a lot of the cities and towns declared did so in the early stages of some of the, uh, either prior to or at the beginning of some of the uh, legislation that had been passed by the governor. So there's less of a legal need right now to do it, but I totally agree with the, with what's been said. There's no downside to it. Um, mm -hmm. I will say just that in many of our cities and towns, they've had both the Board of Health and the Select Board or Board of Selectmen vote do it. Okay. Um, so that's probably why I read that way to, to select, it, select Board Member Yon's uh, question. Well, do I have a motion then to declare a state of emergency? So moved. Do I have a second? Okay. Oh, Paul, go ahead. Do you have a question, comment? Yes, I just was going to say that uh, first I wanted to thank Daryl and uh, Jeff and Zach and Bento and um, uh, Chuck and all the, the key people who have played such an important part in making our community safe. So on behalf of myself and my family and the whole community, I wanted to express profound gratitude for all the work that you've been doing. The second thing I wanted to say is that given the recommendations that we're hearing that we should do this, we should absolutely do this. So therefore, I did want to make the motion to adopt the Declaration of Emergency. Sure. A quick question. I, I like the sample declaration uh, that KP Law drafted and sent around. Um, can we make the motion uh, that we vote to adopt it and would uh, urge the, uh, well, not, I don't think we need 
to urge the Board of Health to do it, but that uh, it go into effect after the Board of Health has adopted it. Okay, so I will, I will convene a meeting and get back to you as quickly as possible. Okay, but well, we can vote tonight. Right, Chuck, okay. is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so I have a motion from Jeff. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Yan? Aye. Mr. Dorensis? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. I vote aye. Vote of five to zero. We've just declared a local state of emergency pending the Board of Health. Um, all right, sorry, I'm out of my agenda for now. The next item on the agenda is a confirmation of the May 1st, 2020 property tax due date. Um, this item's on here as I think the town could vote to ex to move that to June 1st. I think some towns have done that. Um, as we heard from Heidi earlier, it may be a problem for the town financially if we do that. Um, so I just wanna get kind of some opinions from the board on what we should do here. Go ahead, Eric. I'll just like an idea to quantify what the impact would be because um, I think the, um, you know, right now, most people are still employed, probably most people in Sherbin, but that may change. Uh, this, this in four weeks, you see every layer of a new uh, employment group losing their jobs. And I'd like to get an idea of simply uh, what that cost impact is to the town, making it from May 1st to June 1st. Paul? So the legislation that gives us this authority has not passed. We do not have the authority at this point, one way or the other. That was the bill I was asking David Linsky about. Right now it's in the, in the committee on third read, in third read bills in third reading in the House of Representatives. It's, been, it's gone back and forth between the House and the Senate three times so far. So I think this is a little premature to take action on a bill that hasn't even been passed, hasn't been signed, we don't know what the final language is going to be because they're still changing it as we, as we speak. So that that's point number one. Point number two is we have a meeting on for the 16th that we could address this better. Point number three, the issue isn't so much in my mind what the financial condition is of the town, as is the condition of our residents, and in particular, to the extent that people have to go to banks and transfer money and handle money in order to meet a tax payment that's right at the point where there's a crisis or maybe even a worse crisis, it may make sense to not force our residents to go through all of that just at that time. So rather than coming to grips with the issue today, I would propose that we defer this to the 16th, see what gets passed, and at that point, see where we are with the community and with the economy. Because at the end of the day, this is a community of all the taxpayers and all of the citizens of the town, not just the, the corporate town as a, as a corporation. We need to think not only of the cash flow needs, but also the burden that's being imposed on all of our citizens. Okay, I think that's actually, Paul, uh, thank you for clarifying that that legislation hasn't passed. I think that's actually a good suggestion to wait till the 16th to discuss this item. Anybody else on the board have anything to add to that? If not, then we'll move to the next item, which is, I think we have a placeholder for reserve fund transfers, but I don't think we have any tonight because I haven't seen any ahead of time. So, I'm going to move to the next item, which is new dates for the annual town meeting. Um, it looks like Thursday, June 18th or Thursday, June 25th are available. But what about is, don't we typically have like a Tuesday and Thursday? So I have town meetings in other communities and that entire last week of June is now booked with all kinds of town meetings. I have some, some days I have two town meetings that I have to attend. 
So I would urge you to stay on the Thursday and not try to put something on a Tuesday. Okay. It's, Please. it's Jackie. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, so um, that was actually changed. The, um, the school now says that we can go in on Tuesday, June 16th, um, or um, Tuesday, June 23rd. So we, you guys have the option of voting for Tuesday, and then if we need Thursday as the second night, that's that's an option. But Paul just said he doesn't want to do Tuesdays. I, I thought he said the last week, because the uh, I thought he said the last week. I can do the 16th. The 16th? How does the 16th work for everyone else? Eric, Chuck, Jeff, I know Steve Leahy's on here. Mary Wolf, moderator, if you could comment. It's uh, fine with me. Tuesday is good. 16th. So you go to Steve Leahy here. Um, 16th works for me as well. I just, uh, as I back into how long prior to the town meeting uh, that we need to have a public hearing for advisory, I start looking at dates that gets into very, very early May. And so I'm just not sure that, uh, you know, maybe we don't need a full six weeks in between um, public hearing and town meeting. But if we do need six weeks, and I'm not sure if that's statute or just how we choose to do it, I'd love to see if we can push that public hearing to a little further out than early May. Darren, do you have any advice yeah, on that? I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm pretty certain in uh, you know, if, if David is, might want to comment that there's nothing in gen the general laws that requires the advisory board's public caring to be a certain amount of time before town meeting. I think that might be a more of a local. I think it's more of a publishing board. thing with Je is Jeannie on here. Yes. They, I backed out, the, this is Mary speaking. I backed out the dates earlier, just a, in a trial. And it's that the notifications have to go to the people in the town by a certain date. And after advisory has their hearing, they need, you know, maybe a week to 10 days to get it out to the printer and back and yeah. so forth. I had backed it out to May 16th being sort of the possible date there. Okay. Steve Leahy here, that would work for me. If we have a month, that's fine. You know, uh, public hearing happens. Advisory committee will all work to do our darndest, get everything done as quickly as possible, and then um, off to the printers and out to the citizens. So, okay. George? Paul, Paul, go ahead. So the bill that hasn't passed has a provision in there that would allow us to even further postpone town meeting. The fear is, and God, we hope it never happens, that things may be bad in June as they are predicting some pretty dreadful things if you watch the, uh, the news. So the bill provides for even dispensing with town meeting and proceeding with uh, the rule of 112th, that is you take the current year's uh, budget, let's say you have a budget line item, uh, let's say 120,000 to make it easy, you just take 112th of that for each month until you can hold your town meeting. So right now, the law is you have to have it by June 30th. That's why everybody's setting their, their town meetings at the end of June. But with the new legislation that's pending, things are going to open up a little more. Now, I'm not advocating a meeting in July, and I'm not advocating a meeting in August, but there's been talk about allowing town meetings even as late as September. Well, I think what I would like to do is schedule it for the 16th, and if we then have to further delay, do it, because if, if things are opened up by June, I'd like to have the town meeting if possible, and we need to reserve the high school because Dover's going to be trying to squeeze in a meeting right about the same time in the same place. Yeah. So, I, I, Eric, uh, go I, ahead. It's Jackie. Sorry. Oh. I, I um, Just based on speaking to the superintendent's office, I think that Dover already has their meetings meeting planned and that's why I was given those dates. Oh, okay. What do you know when Dover's having theirs? No, I'm assuming it might be the weeks before. Okay. But then that's you know, based on the circumstances, it could change. <laughs> okay. And Eric, did you have a comment? Yeah, just uh two things. One, Mary referenced May sixteenth. I'm just clarifying we mean we're talking June sixteenth, right? Well she's saying May sixteenth for the advisory public hearing. 
Okay, that's good. Because you'd have uh, to you have to have it like a certain amount of time so the notice can go to the citizens after their public hearing. Jeff. Well, I had a, uh... Jeff, go ahead. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I think we'll just have to be flexible because you know you realize if if things aren't as bad as we think and then and we can you know come back in the end of May or something school may still be going they may be having graduation the second or third week of june if it gets pushed back a couple of weeks so you know mm -hmm. the high school doesn't know its schedule or the uh, right. auditorium schedule because school they don't well, know they're letting they're us but what we've already jackie talked to the superintendent and they're reserving the 16th for us if we let what we want well i guess unless they're having like the award ceremony for seniors for the week well, i think our that, town meeting what we're saying will take pre precedence over that okay so just one other comment yeah I, eric does too so eric go ahead paul i'll let eric go go ahead just a quick thing because you're asking individual availability i'm saying in general tuesdays are bad for me just because uh, city council meets on those days but i'll make it to the extent that i can okay paul <laughs> But this was a, a, a word to Steve Leahy about the public hearing. He can do that virtually. So if he's thinking about having everybody come together and maybe things are a little uncertain on the medical front, the rules for remote participation and virtual meetings will be continued in effect at that point because they continue for 45 days after the end of the declaration of emergency. So he should be able to have that meeting without without risk. Thank you, Paul. Good point. All right. Yeah, so let's take a vote to Tanner. Mary, did you have a comment? Mary, yeah, just, a comment. Just two things. Um, one, the other thing we have to be conscious of with respect to the town meeting is we have to have a quorum of 100 people. And, you know, depending on how many people decide to take a chance and show up and so forth, you know, that just to keep it in the back of our minds that that could be an issue, getting a hundred right. people there. And I'm just going to throw this out here and there's been a lot of discussion in the moderators group that uh, sometimes are actually going to hold their meetings outdoors in a field with chairs set up six feet apart if they, if they feel that they have to. So. Yeah, I was going to say, George. Yeah, go ahead. So some of my towns are talking about when they're doing indoor town meetings, that they're going to block chairs. So where you have rows, you cannot physically sit closer than six feet towards mm -hmm. anyone else. And that means that there'd be secondary uh, uh, meeting rooms with the laws allow for uh, uh, auxiliary moderators in a separate meeting room with connected by audio visual means so that we can spread people out if we had to in june so that this the social distances are maintained right chuck a quick question for steve uh, you plan to have that public session as a virtual meeting or in person since it, I, I, david sent around a, a chat saying that uh Dover is looking at a June 1st town meeting with a June 15th election. Um, obviously, the sooner we schedule it, the more, to, to Jeff's point, the more flexibility we have. But there, there is at least one item that I, I would like to get the Coolidge Crossing project going for a lot of reasons, tax reasons, 40B reasons, affordable housing reasons. So I think we have more flexibility the sooner we schedule it than later. And particularly if the advisory meeting is going to be a virtual meeting, I think that makes it a little bit safer. But so question for Steve, what is it going to be an in-person meeting or a virtual meeting? Uh, I've been assuming all along it would have to be in person, though, as was noted a few minutes ago, if we can do it virtually, I'm happy to do it virtually. That's no problem. Darren? It, yeah, you, you can, as, uh, as Paul had alluded to, you can do a public hearing. Uh, uh, virtually, as long as you can set up technology so that uh, people that wanted to speak could uh, obviously get into the virtual meeting and say what they want to say and be able to obviously hear the whole meeting. So you are able to do under the open meeting law changes a public hearing, um, provided you can supply the, the adequate technology to do so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right. Do we have, if we had any other comments, if we could just, hey, do Dave, I have a motion to? David you know, texted Jeff? one, George. Yeah, go ahead. David is texting. I don't know if he can, I'm not sure if David can get through. He said the advisory report has to be in households 10 days before the town meeting. So it has to be mailed June 5th. Right, which if they have a live or virtual public hearing on May 15th, that gives them plenty of time. Right. I just wanted to get his comment in. Yeah. No, I appreciate that because he is, he is texting to the group in a chat on the side. Yeah. If you don't see yeah. it. Um, all right. Do I have a motion to move town meeting to June 16th? So move. Second. So second. Second. All right. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jan. Aye. Mr. Dorensis. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. I vote aye. aye. So five zero. Yes. We need a Thursday as well. We talked about that. I think, yeah, you're right. We probably should set a second night of town meeting for Thursday, June eighteenth, um, if needed. So Do I have moved. a motion for that? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Jan? Aye. Mr. Dorensis? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. I vote aye. Five zero. Thank you guys. Um, the next item on the agenda is to finalize the Prop two and a half ballot question due to the town clerk by April 6th. It's actually the 7th. The 7th, okay. Um, which is next week and we're not having a meeting before then. So I know in our packet we had a copy of the ballot. It's a little odd to be voting on it before advisory has even had a public hearing. Um, but I think we need to get this into her. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yes, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So there's so many of these ballot questions. I'm just wondering, and I guess this is a question for Steve. Can't we do some of the borrowings within the levy limit as opposed to in these troubled times asking taxpayers to increase their tax bills? I don't know if Steve's still on. Um, yep, there, there he is. Uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, Paul. I gotta look into that. Effective, um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I'm just concerned with going to the voters with 10, I think there were 10 debt exclusion overrides, asking the taxpayers to vote 10 times to increase their taxes. When people are losing jobs, and unemployment is uh, unemployment uh, claims are going up to the roof. Paul, if uh, we if we go within the levy limit, that's also going to increase taxes. So I mean, right now we're not taxing up to our levy limit. If if you put some of these same, it's a matter of if we don't want to spend the money on some of these things, that's the only way you're going to actually save any tax money. Because right now we're not taxing up to our levy limit, which is keeping our tax rate low. If you start paying for some of this within the levy limit, it's still going to increase taxes. No, I want to it'll increase it sooner rather than later. The two and a half override spreads it out over a longer period of time. Right. Exactly. Thanks, Chuck. If yeah, debt override is actually going to make it be less less on the tax rate than if we paid for it all this year. What I, what I'm trying to say is I want to keep the tax rate under twenty dollars. You and me both, Bob. And I want to I want to do it in a way, if you go to the voters and ask for all these debt exclusions, that's going to increase the tax rate. Well, the only way not to increase the taxes is not to buy all these things. So we have to go to our DPW director and everybody else who's proposed these items and say, do we really need them this year? It's not whether it's under the levy limit or whether we do a debt exclusion, either way is going to increase the taxes. What's not going to increase the taxes is not buying something. And at the end of the day, the voters get to decide. I mean, I'm quite comfortable letting them decide at that point in time of the, the, the election, but I, I, I prefer the two and a half override if we're going to do it. I'm with you, Chuck, because I think it spreads the cost of the item based on the use of who's using it, rather than if you try to do it within the override. 
within within the levy limit this year, it's going to make our tax rate go closer to 20, Paul, actually. So I would prefer to spread it out. And I think that's going to help. And if people don't want to buy these things, then it gives the voters the chance to choose that. It's Jackie. Can I can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I know on the agenda we have to discuss moving the election. So if we can, if you guys decide to continue with the election on May twelfth, um, the voters are not going to know any of the dollar amounts. But if we do the election after town meeting, then possibly they would be better informed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just saying I, I worry about that people aren't going to vote, you know, for the ballot questions if they don't understand how much everything's going to That's happen. a good point, Jackie. Darren, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Well, so, so, I mean, I know David's, I, it sounds like David's not on, but the way it was explained to me was, I mean, I think the assumption is, although obviously the board hasn't discussed their main decisions yet, is that the election will be postponed. And, and the problem is, is there's a little bit of a quirk in at least the current legislation in that you have the ability to postpone the election but the other deadlines associated with uh, what's on the ballot have not yet been extended. They may be very soon, but as of right now, they haven't been. And with the April 7th deadline, that's why you have to sort of vote on what you are putting on the ballot tonight, even though in a more typical situation, you would have a lot of the discussions you're having right now and all the way up to town meeting, um, you know, before finalizing the ballot. So I think the assumption is you, you, you're, you're most likely not going to bring these to the voters for the, obviously, before town meeting, but it depends on what you're going to do on the next part of the Maybe we should be voting on the date of the election first, guys. I think that makes more sense. Okay. So let's skip over this one for now and move Mary to the had next. a question. Did you read Mary's question about the borrowing uh, levy limit? Yeah. Hold on just a second. No. So borrowing within the levy limit still is borrowing, and it isn't all paid within one year, isn't it? It's just that the debt service has to be within the two and a half percent as opposed to in addition to. So if you borrow within the levy limit, then, you know, in order to keep within the levy limit, you might have to make cuts elsewhere. But because of the debt service is then included instead of in addition to on top of. So your 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 debt seal the maximum allowable uh, rate that you can use is, I'm sorry, the maximum amount allowable levy is lower, but you're still, you're still borrowing, you're still spreading it out over n years. It's just that now that has to be within the two and a half limit. So you don't have the full two and a half limit to spend elsewhere if you wanted to. I believe that's correct. George, can we get Steve's view on this? Yeah, Steve, go yeah. ahead. I think that a, in a way, a more simple way to think of this is that any, any capital items that we need, oftentimes we try to fund some of the smaller capital items from ongoing, ongoing revenues um, into our free cash. And I think Kind of the end result here from what Paul first suggested is to ensure that any capital items get tossed into a borrowing situation rather than spending any um, annual revenues or free cash on them. I think, Paul, that would, that would get you to what you were suggesting. Well, if you spent free cash on them, you wouldn't be raising the tax rate. Right. Fair point. So, I, I mean, I think the difference here is whether you want to limit how high you can spend on other things versus do you want to, it, you know, the, if you borrow outside the levy limit, that's an override. It's a temporary override, but it allows you to, you know, raise the taxes beyond what you ordinarily 
could under two and a half, but it doesn't, you can still borrow within the two and a half limit and the debt service will be added every year. It's just that it won't be on top of the levy limit. It will be within the levy limit, but you're still borrowing over a number of years, whatever number of years that is that the mm -hmm. treasurer goes out and borrows for. Okay. If I could, I'm just worried about the message we're sending to our residents. We have people, we have people dying, they're losing jobs. And in our wisdom, we go to them and say, here are 10 things we want you to vote on to raise your taxes. It just seems off. I, I'm just saying, I don't think it matters whether you borrow within or without the levy limit. Yeah. The, what George said, the fact that you're asking them to spend $200,000, period. Exactly. If you don't want it, Paul, you should ask to have it not bought this year. That's the only way you're going to save any money for people on taxes. I wonder if there's a benefit to us prioritizing them. I don't know. I, 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 I wasn't there that one Saturday for your all day meeting with the DPW, but I, I wonder if the 10 items, if we want to prioritize them, I don't know. We can think about it. Is it so? Is this a whole debate now seems to resolve around the debt exclusion, right? In other words, the April seventh date or whatever it is. Yes. And if we defer the election date, or could we then defer this decision? No. Jackie said no when I talked to her earlier today. Or, no, you, you, that or at least the way the special legislation reads right now, it has not delayed the other deadline. It's a quirk that we're trying to get resolved with the governor. But right now, as crazy as it sounds, the, the ballot deadlines have not been extended, even though you have the right to postpone your election. Jack, Jackie, did you have something to add? Sorry, Eric, I'll get to well, you. Well, I was just going to ask Darren. D Darren, do you think that they're going to change, change it? I, I would say yes, but I would have also told you a week and a half ago that we would have thought it would have already happened. Uh -huh. uh, and we, we, we really thought it was going to happen even in the initial legislation. So it's hard to say. There's a lot of different pieces that are being suggested to the governor on a daily basis. I'm sure Paul has been involved in a lot of that as well. Uh, Eric, go ahead. So, I mean, just to what Darren said, so other deadlines associated with the election are not being pushed, just the election itself. So like uh, submission of nomination papers, that's still passed and done and that doesn't get pushed with the, with the election due to the COVID-19. Yeah, the, the dates are all the same. Um, it, the only dates that are changing or, or more have to do with the clerk's office and that would be voter registration and the last day to take an absentee ballot but everything else is already changed. And we didn't have anybody pull nomination papers, so that's kind of the moot point. None of the, none of the um, uh, things on the ballot, none of the races are contested this year. Okay, so let's skip over the, this for one second and move to the town election postponement item. Um, I would like to do the town election after town meeting, I just think, as Jackie said, that makes the most sense to me when people are voting on these questions. Um, so if we're going to have town meeting June 16th or June 18th, maybe we should plan the election on the next Tuesday, the 23rd. Would that work, Jackie? Yes. Yes, it would. You guys okay. also could vote tonight just to postpone the election to and then vote later if you guys aren't comfortable with voting for the date mm -hmm. you could wait I, yeah I, i'm the reason i say june 23rd is because i know the schools are not going to go past june 30th and i worry if things are open back up and people are people are leaving after june 30th you know i, I want to if if things are operational then we could have everything done right well i i think the 23rd makes complete sense um one thing also is that we are required to still have live polling place. I'm still gonna have to have a polling place and I need to have it for four, hour, uh, for four hours. And so you guys can vote on what hours you want. You don't have to do it tonight. But um, we are, uh, we've been told to encourage people to um, absentee ballot or early ballot, early vote. 
So people still gonna be doing that, but I still am expected to have the polling place open, which is kind of crazy. Okay, what does everybody else think about postponing it to June 23rd? Does that make sense to everybody? Or should we just leave the date open at this point? Uh, David has texted that he thinks we can leave the date open in the chat box. So I, I, I'm fine either way. I don't have a strong opinion myself. Paul? I'm wondering whether we have to do this today. This isn't like the ballot questions. What, why can't we do it on the 16th or some other time? Okay. Well, let's just vote to delay it. I think we do need to vote to delay it, though. Yes. So do I have a motion to delay town meeting, to, I mean, town election, and we'll set the date at a later date? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jan. Aye. Mr. Drances. I'm going to abstain because I'm on the ballot. So okay. I don't think it's appropriate for me to vote on something that has to do with my own election. Mr. Waldron. Aye. I'm going to vote aye, even though I am on the ballot, but. Um, <laughs> can I, can I uh, just so, say you, you are allowed, you are allowed to, to, to vote, even if you are on the ballot because of the right. emergency situation. So that's confirmation from KP, you know, from Darren should, should be able to confirm that. Okay. Well, it's four to zero to one absten abstention. So, so the town election has been postponed. Now back to these two and a half questions. Are there ones that you want removed, Paul? Because I know you said you don't want to ask people 10 questions. Are there certain things you want to take off there? Because we have to vote on it tonight. What about grouping them together so that there's fewer questions? I think last year we discussed this. And one of the thing, because Sean did group his things last year. And the question was, do you want an all or nothing situation? where people can vote where he gets nothing, or people can vote where he gets everything? Or do you wanna give them the choice to pick individual items? We lost the dump truck one year that way by having things individual, but you never know. Um, Chuck, Eric, do either of you have any thoughts on this? Oh, Steve, you could, Steve, do you wanna chime in? Go yeah, ahead. Just, just real quickly, guys. So currently the advisory budget's running about 1.2 million below the levy limit. Um, we, I agree, Paul, that in a time of what's certainly likely to be um, tough fiscal times, if we can further reduce the burden on our citizens, we certainly should. Um, the most recent version of the capital budget um, committee's document that I have is asking for about 2.6 million in capital expenditures for fiscal year 2021. And so if we could reduce that 2.6 million, that'd be great. Yeah, I think like we may need to go back in a way. I mean, let me ask you this. What if we put a ballot, say we had to put these ballot questions out there because we have to vote on them now. If they change the legislation between now and the seventh, Darren, can we revoke what we vote on tonight and revisit this? Um, good question. Uh, I think it's Eric, going to depend on the voting member of the board. What's that? <laughs> uh, I think it is, I think it's going to depend on the language of that legislation. It's hard for me to answer that without seeing the specific language. It may, it could include a rider like that, knowing that some cities and towns had to do this prematurely. Um, but it, it's, it's really going to depend on the language of that potential new legislation. Okay. Chuck, I saw you wave at me, so. Yeah, and a middle ground, too, would be to vote to put these on the ballot and then at town meeting recommend, advisory and the select board recommend that the 2.6 be cut down to whatever lower number we agree upon, because if they don't get approved at town meeting, then it, they'll it's irrelevant whether they're on their election ballot because it requires right. both. Sean, I see you came unmuted. Sean, do you have something to say? Yeah, I was going to say something. There's a there's a few items that could easily be grouped, and and keeping in mind that the, you're not voting the dollar amount tonight, 
So by grouping, not everything, because road work shouldn't be grouped with, uh, you know, a mower. But um, one, we were still playing around with the number that the road work capital was going to be. We already reduced it. But the of the of the equipment, if it if it's one item on the ballot, um, I think some of that can fall off in the process now, and the number can be reduced because it was a, it was a group of of items. It, does that make sense? There was four or five things in one line item. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, Versus if you had six ballot questions, we still could drop them off and the ballot question becomes moot. But it'll, it, you know, it'll, it'll be pretty confusing if we're asking the voters, all right, vote on this one and this one and this one's moot. Uh, and we took that one out and this one's really important. I think we'll get lost in that. Steve, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I just need to update. Um, I knew that 2.6 was off. There have been some changes to it. The capital total capital requests are actually 1.4. Um, there's there a large one that was taken off for 2021. So the current capital requests are 1.4. And again, we're we are at 1.2 million under levy limit by the advisory model at this point in time. Okay. What does anybody suggest we do here? I mean, you think we should group some of them? We think, what, what do we want to do? So the only, I have one thought. Um, the only thing that concerns me about grouping in is you don't know even the positions that the board's going to take on these appropriations at town meeting. So if you grouped three or four together, like Sean said, but at town, but then you get to the town meeting and for whatever reason the board recommends against them, I don't know how the ballot question works then because two of right. the appropriations that failed the town meeting are lumped together. So I think we're not in a perfect situation right now, a, just another one because of obviously the pandemic. It seems to me with this imperfect situation, the best way is to keep them separate. But that's just, yeah. I, I tend to agree with I'm Darren on this. I think we should just keep it as it is now. And if things get voted down at town meeting, then the ballot question is Move. irrelevant anyway. Yeah. And it also makes it easier for us to say we support one, three, seven, and eight and don't support the others. Right, because things change since we right. voted, since we had to vote on this right. prematurely. Jeff, do you have something? Jeff, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Makes sense to me. Okay. Do I have a motion then to approve the ballot questions as proposed, the 10 questions? So move. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Yan? Aye. Mr. Dorensis? Uh, yes. Mr. Waldron? Uh, aye. <laughs> <laughs> I vote aye as well. Five to zero. Thank you guys. I know that's a tough one to but figure the, out right now. I have to feel about it as well. So next item is consideration of administration items. Finance director. Is Sharon on the call? I, I haven't seen her name anywhere. I, I don't think she is. So I guess and she sent out around a budget. Um, she sent around a budget update on email the other day. So if you want to go in and take a look at that, that's a good update for where we're at. Um, town administrator report, David, I don't know if your audio is working. Um, do you have anything you can text it if you want to skip over that part? Okay. Uh, he just wrote the sustainability coordinator is on board. Uh, they split it between Gino and what's her name, Jeff, the woman's. Dorothea. 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 Thank you. Um, so those are, they're on board. Um, and they start they started this week with the energy committee is what david just added so that's good that's good um next item is select board reports and sean pointed out to me earlier over a private text that we didn't discuss the issue that he had in our packet regarding the town of natick work on route 27 so i'm going to let him give an update on that right now can you hear me george yeah go ahead all right so Gentlemen, you, you have a letter that was sent to us from the um, the engineer, the town engineer was the, for the town of Natick. 
And for anyone that isn't seeing that, it, what it does, it summarizes the work that's going to go on in, at least on our side of downtown Natick. Natick is actually about to start working on their North Main Street and their South Main Street at the same time. So we're going to see as a town traffic disruptions when traffic picks back up again in Natick in general. Um, the construction that's going to be their South Main, which is basically from the town line uh, to downtown, is going to be 16 months, probably at least. We won't see disruptions all the time, but a lot of most of the work, it'll be localized detours within their the area. Um, there's times they won't be able to allow the trucks. Everyone probably remembers two or three years ago they had a, they had to do a truck restriction because they were doing water main work almost every day, so they were forcing the trucks up Coolidge Street. They had a signboard that they put, and they're requesting to put in the same place again, which will be in that uh, grassy area, basically directly across from the front door of uh, the Douse's house, across from the uh, orchard stand at Coolidge and North Main. The signboard will be there probably for the entirety of the project. They'll keep changing the messages. Um, it'll, it'll just alert that there's going to be traffic disruptions, and then there's going to be times where they're going to have to do a full detour where no trucks can enter, no cars or trucks can enter Natick via Route 27. They'll have to get off at Coolidge Street or Everett uh, and head towards South Natick. So this is basically, the letter is basically requesting uh, the permission to put the signboard there. They've already put up some signage on their side, which is covered if anyone's been through uh, that end of Natick. And next week, they're actually going to start relocating telephone poles and, and starting the project. Eric, I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead. Yep, just a couple things. One, I do know a little bit about this project. I think the northern portion is a TIP project and the southern portion is uh, locally funded. But it actually is a, is a regional corridor. And when it's done, it'll be to the benefit of Sherb. And so it does help, it does uh, behoove us to actually support it to some degree. I just want to make sure that any VMBs and signage and details are not funded by Sherbin, but are funded by NATIC because it is ultimately their project. Okay. Right. Um, I do see that Sharon has been unmuted. She was on here and I just didn't recognize her number. So Sharon, did you have anything to add? Sure, uh, just a quick update. In terms of our FY20 financials, things uh, I sent around something yesterday to everybody. Uh, things are looking good through the end of March. Um, our finances are tracking well. We're actually doing better. Uh, so we have a positive variance of 4.65%, which given the cur current um, tumultuous uh, COVID-19 environment, um, I'm sure we will definitely chew through that 4.65%. Um, I did want to let you know that currently um, we are tracking all of the expenses that are related to the COVID-19 virus. Um, as of the last warrant, the expenditures were low, 4,477. Um, there is a new expenditure. Um, they were able to secure um, N95 masks and that, that would be an additional expense of 6,970. So that brings our, our current expenses 14,083, so not too bad. Um, and then the other update, I just wanted to tell you uh, in, in terms of the budget, um, nothing has changed. Um, we are still on version nine, and as Steve pointed out, we are uh, we do have excess levy capacity of 1.2. Right now, the budget, um, the tax rate prediction is still under 20. So, got to keep um, Paul Drensis and and Steve Lay happy. So, um, but there are there are other things that advisory is looking at. So, it, it's not done yet. That's for sure. I think, and to just to clarify that, Sharon, I, Steve Leahy actually just sent me an email that says, I think currently you're tracking at a tax rate of 1958, which is not much over last year at 1946. So that's that's good. You're right. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. it's only a 12 cent increase. So yeah, it's it's looking good, and there's and there's more to do. And I know that Stephen and his his team want to make further cuts. So okay. Looking well, thanks, good. Sharon. Sorry, I skipped over you during your. Uh, your your point i just didn't see your name on there so um okay not to so worry john we'll go back to you to or jeff did you have a question for sharon before 
Well, not a question. I want to add on something. Can I was, uh, maybe you guys were on too, but I was on the uh, Lieutenant Governor's call on Tuesday. So the way MEMA, because we'll be reimbursed, supplying, uh, submitting for reimbursement of a lot of the COVID costs that we occur that are incremental to our normal budget. One thing they're doing differently, unlike a snowstorm where you wait till it's all over and then submit the final cost, they're going to be um, doing rolling reimbursement so that you can submit partial expenses to date, get reimbursed, and then submit subsequent expenses later. So that we, on a cash flow basis, we may be able to get some reimbursement for MEMA for some of our costs uh, related to COVID. And uh, Sharon, we talked about this two or three weeks ago, has set up a separate COVID account in each budget maker's budget. Yes, I have done that and it's been communicated to everyone. And also, oh, am I on mute? That. And we're, we're also reviewing the expenses that come in, and if we have a question, we will reach out to the department head to make sure that everything's being captured appropriately. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Sean, You're welcome. sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think we can get back to your discussion about the Natick project and the, the use of that space for the sign. Uh, based my, while I wait to see your unmute button come on, I'll just say I think it sounds like something we need to do. My only question is what's the effect on Coolidge Street? I know we just repaved it. If they have a lot of trunk traffic, is that going to affect that road? Um, well, the, most of the, uh, the actual detours aren't going to be that extensive. It's going to, only going to be a few weeks at a time. Uh, and, and probably only total, maybe one month total of the 16 months. And frankly, Coolidge Street gets more truck traffic than almost any other street in town, so okay. it, it, but it, it won't be that bad on it. But it's um, going to get even more. I mean, the detour, uh, the signage makes sense. It'd be good for anyone driving through town to know what's going on. But the detour for northbound is going to affect Coolidge more than Route 27 north. I mean, it's just heavier traffic. The, um, I mean, I think we should do it. I agree with Eric. It should be at their nickel. I think mm -hmm. we should also remind them about our cooperation with them when we're talking about uh, sewer hookup for Coolidge Crossing. Um, but I, I think it's something we should do. Yeah. Do we need to vote on anything on that, Sean? I, I don't think so. I mean, okay. it was just to let us I, know what I, was I happening. Gave him, I, I gave him conditional approval. I told him I needed to come to you guys. It was, it was fortunate it was tonight. They're trying to put the signboard up tomorrow just to get it out there um so they were kind of waiting in the wings I, I don't think you need to vote on it it's i don't, I don't okay i just i don't it requires a vote eric go ahead just a quick point of information because the state is actually investing in some of that corridor it actually um would help sherbin in the future if we ever wanted state funds at least in the tip process to for our route, our route section of route 27 corridor it helps it a lot the fact that they're investing in the corridor and they do it in a budding community the next community owners over score a lot better um, for our state funds. Good. Certainly does. And one other comment, Eric, this is uh, primarily a, a complete streets project on on this side, the south main side. Yeah, that's good. That's huge. Okay. Um, do we have any other select board reports? If not, we're going to adjourn from our open session. Um, let me ask a clarifying question here. Do we need to like hang up on this Zoom and do another Zoom or just wait for everyone else to leave, Darren? Uh, I don't know the, the uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, it's, I guess I'll, I defer to your IT person on how to, to do that. Um, we, or, uh, David said he can kick everybody out. He I, just, no. <laughs> for executive committees on my board, yeah. you can, David, who's up as the administrator, can knock everyone up who shouldn't be in the executive session. Yep, that's what that's what he's working on now. I think he's yep. kicking people out as we speak. So I'll take a motion to adjourn. Hi, Sean. So moved. Out of the open session. I don't actually have the script in front of me that I need to read to go into an executive session, but I'll try just from memory. Um, I, we're now out of open session, adjourning to uh adjourning to executive session not to return to open session 
Item 1, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to threat and potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town and the chair, so declares library. Item 2, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 2, to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, DPW Director, Building Manager, and Town Administrator. Item 3, MGL Chapter 30A, sub Section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town. And the chair so declares police officers union. The chair does declare on those. Um, so do I have a second? Second. Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Yan. Aye. Mr. Gerences. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Thank you.